Uh, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hey, everyone. You're being recorded, so don't shout obscenities, lest your <laughs> reputation be completely dispersed. Um, I'm Eric Frierson. I'm the Senior Discovery Services Engineer with EBSCO. Uh, with me is Mike Waugh, uh, Systems Librarian at uh, Louisiana State University Library. Uh, we're presenting today on course readings and learning management systems. So uh, for learning management <laughs> systems, think Blackboard, Sakai, Desire to Learn, Canvas, Moodle, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, uh, who will go ahead and get started, uh, started here. <laughs> All right, well, um, yeah, I'm the systems librarian at uh, LSU. Um, just real quickly, what a discovery layer is. I'm sure a lot of people know what it is, but I'll just uh, briefly describe it. Uh, we have, uh, we're using EBSCO Discovery Service. Uh, we brand it as Discovery at LSU. Um, and on our website, we use it as the primary search. Uh, the main thing that it does is it allows uh, people to search our catalog records at the same time as searching uh, our database content, particularly uh, the full text content. Uh, so people can go into it, search, and get go right to the full text. And of course, we're promoting our full text a lot. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I want to demonstrate real quick uh, what the uh, what the element, what our plugin is going to do. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to, uh, let's see, I'm going to have to exit the show and then come back to it. Oh, and it's up. Okay, good. And Bear with us because we don't actually see this on our computer, so <laughs> we do a lot of misclicks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, right now I'm going to Moodle. At LSU we use uh, our LMS, Learning Management System, is, uh, is Moodle which means that it's administrated by uh, people at LSU, um, but it's hosted uh, off-site. So this is, um, you know, learning ma management software. I'm, you know, it could be Blackboard, and you've, done, you've talked about a couple of uh, what those might be. So in order to create a reading list, what we're going to try to do is create a reading list inside of Moodle. Uh, it connects to our discovery profile uh, so that people can search for items within the, within Moodle, basically, and then uh, they'd be able to create a reading list, and then students can come over and just click on it and go right to the full text. So uh, I go to um, go to my course right here. Uh, before Mike dives into the actual creation of the reading list, this was intended to solve a, a common problem that I think uh, all of us who have ever done liaison work with faculty members, and that's. Getting library materials into the learning management system is not a <coughs> trivial task. Um, a lot of times, fa there are what two basic ways to do it. There's the uh, yeah. Well, know, I can go into that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, and there's a yeah. Once you describe go back the to the slide. Yeah. Um, and I'll try to bring PowerPoint back up. Let's see, maybe just hit the the, sh the slideshow button. That might go. That one. Yeah. Yeah. There Beautiful. And flip it over. Okay. So yeah. So in the in the best case scenario, I guess you would say, is that um, what are the steps needed to create a list um, without this tool, basically? <laughs> so the the instructor would have to go to the uh, discovery layer, which we brand as discovery, find the material, do their search, type it in, do the search, find the search. That's just the beginning. Then uh, they would have to view the full record. Uh, and there's a link on the right side where somebody would click to uh, find the permalink because if they just copy the, the, what's in the uh, address bar of the browser, there's no guarantee that that link is going to work a little bit later because it's session dependent. So they have to copy the permalink, then uh, it's on their clipboard, switch their browser over, uh, pay, uh, put, go to, back to the Moodle, back to the LMS, um, at this point, uh, hopefully they've already created a little section that they're going to create their links uh, reading list in, and then they would have to paste it in there and then hope that the student got there. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the best case scenario. The less than optimal scenario is that the, uh, the instructor might uh, send the article, whatever article they want, 
off to the coffee shop and then the students have to pay for it. Well, um, if, the, if the library's already paid for it, then uh, that's not really an optimal scenario right there um, because the students and the library are both paying for it. The instructor might also upload their personal copy to the LMS. Um, that's not optimal either because we don't know how the instructor got the material, the full text. We don't know if it's licensed. Um, there's a uh, fair use is uh, enters a gray area whenever um, things are used over and over and over over time. So uh, the best best case there would be if uh, if you grab the material from licensed resources, which the uh, library would have. <clears throat> so now let me go. Now with all that, let's see what we can do. Um, with the reading list tool. So uh, I've got some samples already up here. And I want to scroll down. Well, I guess I can't. Let's see. What I want to do is edit my course. Let's see. <coughs> How can I scroll down over here? Maybe I want to click there. So you could add just a new list of topic one there. There we go. Just got it. Okay, so I'm going to add the activity. Bear with me. Okay, and then uh, it's going to be an external tool. We're using something called the LTI protocol to um, communicate what between point out the that, two. That for most faculty members, they're going to be used to this kind of process because they've added syllabi to their courses, they've added assignments to the courses, discussion boards to the courses. This is the same link that they would use to do those things, except the option that they choose for a library reading list is now this external tool uh, business. All right, so we'll give it a uh, we'll give it a name. You know, readings. What was that for eight, week eight? Yeah. Um, here we have it configured. This which uh, which external tool are we using? We're going to use the LSU libraries, and then um, we'll save it. And that's all they have to do right there. So, oh, our our block we got blocked, but uh, we'll click through the browser. Normally it would just pop up and go right to the screen. And here this is where somebody would do a search. Um, so. This is where I'm going to try to type in front of people and not be successful. So we'll look for uh, we'll look for things written uh, by Clifford Lynch, um, as, and we've got some things right here in the in the first screen. Uh, here, uh, this one looks like a good one. Lecture. Uh, Impact of digital scholarship on research libraries. If I want to, this one has full text right here. So if I want to add it to my reading list, I just click on it. It it switches the button switches over to uh, remove from reading list. Uh, let's add a couple things. Um, we'll add two of them. There we go. So those have been added to the reading list. So I'm still in Moodle. Um, it's do, this is. This emulates the uh, the interface of the discovery service. It's not exactly the same. Um, the style's a little bit different, and um, some things. But it's it's based on the API, so it's um, you know, it's different, but it's the same. I guess the best way I could say that. So now uh, I want to go over to the uh, current reading list. So I'm seeing this as the instructor, remember, and then uh, I can see the two things that are on the reading list. Uh, the two items right here, and did I, did I choose the same thing? I think you did. Oh, That's nice. <laughs> it was two of the same thing, but um, uh, so let me. I want I want two different things. Yeah, there were just two same things. This is the one I wanted. Let's try this one. Okay. Now remove that one. 
So I can click on it again and remove it. So now I've got two different things here. Um, one thing I can do is I can add notes to it. So um, something like this is required reading or um, you know, please read the section on digital libraries. Something, uh, something like that. I can change the order of them um, right there. So if I want this to be, well, that one to be first, and this one, let's say we want to make that second. Um, click here, it updates the order. Um, I can also um, add URLs or web resources to it. So um, let's say I wanted to add, um, you know, some things from uh, CNI. You know, or network uh, information, right? Add that. Uh, once it's there, I can also say, um, you know, something like visit this site and watch some videos, right? Because we like watching their videos. So, uh, and then save it, basically. And it would be there. Um, you can choose to, uh, right now as a default, it's a private reading list, but that means is that uh, other instructors don't see it. But if you make it public, and click here to make it public, um, it would be a public reading list so that other instructors, let's say they're in uh, different sections of the same course, um, would be able to copy the list and bring it over. You, or if you're, um, of course, the instructor could copy their own list. Um, uh, let's look, if you were uh, copying from another list, let's look at what we would do there. We would import from the exist from an existing list. Uh, we would see some of the lists here. Um, let's look at uh, this one. So we would view that list. And here we've got some things that are in this example list, uh, just a sample. Um, and we might choose which ones we want. Maybe we don't want all of them. But we have these uh, Joyce Carol Oates sort of articles, um, even a web resource. Up here we have uh, options to include the notes themselves and to preserve the order that they're in. Uh, whenever we do that, uh, we can also check or uncheck them all. So we copy that over, and then everything from that list comes over to this list right here. And there they show up at the bottom with the notes since I copied the notes over. So that would be useful if we had a lot of uh, sections of the same arc, uh, same class. And then, um, real quickly, just to show you what it might look like with a, um, let's see, I'm going to have to go back to here. I think. Nope, here. Or here. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Just to show you what a uh, how a student would see it. So I'm going to switch my role over to a student. So this is what the student sees. We just made readings for week eight. Oh, pop up blocked again. <laughs> you you only have to set that once and then it's done. But we're on somebody. But this is what the student says sees. Uh, is just the um, the name of the article with the notes, and then they come here. You get the uh, abstract or what it is, but then uh, this is the holy grail right here is one click access to it because at LSU we use Sibleth. Um, the students are used to logging in if they need to check their email, if they need to go to Moodle, they're already logged in. So uh, whenever they go to this tool in Moodle they've already authenticated. So uh, if the instructor creates the reading list ahead of time, um, they just click on it and then they're there. And uh, I 
think with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. So in sum, uh, what this does is it eliminates the need for faculty members to struggle with permalinks, because unless you do that on a daily basis, like you know, librarians deal with, it's not a trivial thing to find an appropriate permalink. This eliminates the need for that entirely. Um, as Mike was adding different items to the reading list, it was actually just copying in the appropriate linking. So we're not actually making copies of the PDF, and every time a student clicks on one of those uh, full text links to jump out to the full text, it's registering as a full text use in the library system and accessing the library's licensed copy of that item. Um, so not only does it kind of uh, help us with copyright issues because we're only linking to licensed copies of it, but also helps us with collection development. So, uh, you know, we were out at, uh, I think it was St. Louis University here in town, and we were, uh, we were mentioning this tool, and the collection development librarian actually spoke up and said, the thing that I get annoyed with when faculty members upload PDF documents to our learning management system is that it counts as one use the moment they downloaded the PDF, but then we never know about the 90 students that were actually using that article. Um, yesterday during... Um, uh, one of the assessment and evaluation uh, presentations that was done, um, they mentioned on collecting the right statistic in order to determine what's important at the library. And they made mention that at Stanford, the most uh, frequently circulated item was the Lord of the Rings DVD series. And if you make your judgment based on what's the most important thing at Stanford University libraries based on that statistic, it would obviously be Frodo and, and, and Gandalf. Um, however, what what, uh, what Chris, uh, Chris Borg suggested is what's really important are what are our students interacting with in this enterprise of teaching and learning. And this tool might actually provide you with a list of readings that students are using over the course of, a, you know, of, of working through class projects and that kind of thing. Uh, so this tool is built using an open protocol called the LTI protocol. It stands for Learning Tools Interoperability. How many of you have heard of LTI before? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, both from EBSCO, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, the LTI protocol, how many of you uh, work for libraries on the library side of the house? Most of you. How about the IT side of the house? Okay. Um, for the most part, LTI is more of an IT side of the house acronym. MARC is to libraries, LTI is to the IT side of the house. Um, it's a protocol that allows uh, libraries universities or even library vendors, anyone essentially to design websites that interact with learning management systems in interesting ways. Um, so let's take our learning management system here on the left, or CMS, course management system, depending on the acronym you choose. Most course management systems have modules for like quizzes and for uh, adding just links out to the web or <laughs> creating folders or assignments or something like that. Um, all of the major LMSs, I, I rattled off a list of five or six of them. Uh, we took a look at the, you know, the market shares of the variety of different learning management systems out there. About 95% of the, the LMSs that are out there on campuses in the United States have an LTI module in there. Now, all an LTI module is, is it's a link pointing to some other website, to some external website. So unlike a quiz or a folder or an assignment, which all stays in within the Moodle or within the learning management system box, the LTI tool is just simply a link that points you to another website. But the nice thing about LTI and what makes it different from just a link out to another website is that that little blue line actually sends along quite a bit of information to our website, our reading list tool website that we can then use to create a very customized experience for the student. Um, oops, part of that, I'm not going to read through all of these things, but part of that launch will send the user's full name and email address, and I hear privacy flags probably going up at this point, and we'll discuss that. Um, it actually can go over a secure system to where that's not actually, um, you know, it, it's, it would be hard to ping into it as it's making that process, but over on a reading list tool, I'll note that we actually don't keep and store student information. We do store faculty names so we can give faculty members the tool to be able to manage their own lists and things like that. Uh, but outside of that, we do not keep uh, students' names or email addresses, and we never associate who's reading what. Um, although, it, I guess it really depends on who you're talking to, right? If, you, if you're talking with a librarian, chances are privacy is very high up on our values list. Uh, whereas if you're, you know, if you're talking to an institutional researcher, you know, their day-to-day -day job involves working with this kind of sensitive data on a daily basis. So for them, they might take a different perspective to this kind of data. And on your campus, you, you may want to decide, 
since it's all in house and it's over secure channels, do we want to gather, you know, what, you know, do we want to say that, uh, do we want to start profiling our students that this student is a heavy library user because they have clicked on more library materials than a, a Y type of, of student? But in addition to that information, that little click sends over what role the user is. So if I'm a student and I clicked on an LTI link, my reading list tool knows there are a student coming in or a faculty member coming in, as well as which institution they're coming from, which course they're coming from, which list in the course they're coming from. And all of that allows my reading list tool to pull the right reading list and provide the right functionality. So when Mike clicked on it, when he was logged in as a course instructor, it gave him a search box. That's because it knew, okay, someone's coming in from LSU from this course and they clicked this uh, Joyce Carol Oates list that they want to work on. And because they're a faculty member, they get a search box. When he switched his role over to a student, they got that same list, but it noticed they're a student, so I'm just going to give them the list of readings to do. So that's what the LTI protocol allows you to do, is to build fairly creative tools that can use knowledge of who the, the incoming user is to design a fairly cohesive experience. Um, I'm not going to dive into this too much, but on the back end, it really does involve a few different pieces. You've got the Moodle piece, where it takes about, I think, I think yesterday during one of the sessions, someone said uh, fac the, you know, uh, uh, vendors are approaching faculty members directly and getting them to advocate for tools and having them say, it only takes 30 seconds of work on behalf of the Blackboard admin. Well, this actually only takes about 30 seconds of work on behalf of the Blackboard admin. Um, the LTI tool setup itself is actually relatively low effort. However, your campus may have uh, policies where they want to evaluate the tool, make sure it's not going to break, make sure it, you know, it, it adheres to privacy issues. So yeah, technically it's a 30 second setup, but in reality there's probably some, some hurdles that getting the tool approved in Blackboard uh, may take. Um, once that's set up in Moodle, um, there are a couple of different approaches to getting this tool on your own campus. One is we do provide downloadable code for EDS customers um, on our EDS wiki. And you could have this up and running uh, on your own local servers with your own local expertise managing it. Um, that's the tool, that, that red box. And anytime someone clicks on a add to reading list, we store the title of that item as well as the appropriate link to that item in a local uh, MySQL database. And that search just interacts with the EBSCO Discovery Service API to pull back the results. So faculty member types in something that search box, it tosses that you know, uh, global climate change over into the EDS API. EDS API returns the results that they, that they want, and that's when they start adding things to the list. Um, however, we realize that not a lot of libraries really want to be managing their own applications like this. So come May 31st, EBSCO is actually going to be offering a hosted version of this tool where the only part that needs to be done on your campus is this little bit right here in Moodle. The rest would be taken care of. Um, Mike, do you want to... Oh, you already hit it. Right. Um, so the implementation of this, it was a little unusual for us. This is before the hosted version is coming out uh, next month, of course. So uh, what we did is, um, it's, a, it's a little unusual because there's at least three different peop, uh, groups of people or servers involved. Um, one is that the EDS um, reading list tool, uh, the, the code and the SQL databases are located on library servers. Um, so I was able to do that part of it. Um, the API itself and then the discovery layer is hosted on uh, EBSCO servers, of course, so when you do a, whenever you perform a search or if you're trying to access the full text, you're going to uh, EDS or EBSCO right there. And then um, the Moodle part of it has to be administered by, in our case, the LSU IT department, uh, which is outside of the library. Um, they, they had to set up some, you know, the, the thing that where you go and uh, add list to the um, uh, to the course. Um, I like to say that my job as a systems librarian is to get these different systems to talk to each other. Um, so this is an example of this. Um, one thing I found is that, um, you know, to step back and take kind of a broader picture of this is that um, it allows the library to build relationships um, outside of the library. Uh, for one, for the students, uh, it's that holy grail, the one-click access to the full text. So if the instructor has gone through the trouble of building the, 
building the reading list, then um, the student just sees the reading list, they click on it. It could be uh, midnight or 1 a.m., and um, the student just clicks on it and they can read their materials for the next day uh, for class. So uh, they're already authenticated because um, if they've gotten into Moodle, then they've gotten to, they've already authenticated for the discovery layer. Um, the other thing it does is it uh, allows the library to um, interact with the instructors. It gives them a tool to make their job easier because they want to set up their learning environment, um, whether it's online or not. Um, so this is a tool for them. Um, basically, the library is going to where the people are. They're already on Moodle. They're in their learning management system. You know, it could be another system, but um, they're there, and uh, the library is going out to them. You know, we hear a lot of talk these days about uh, the, the library without walls or a library that's 24-7 sort of thing. And as we're buying more electronic, full-text access to resources, um, we want to have an opportunity at, in a library to uh, let, this, let people use that stuff. So uh, it's a chance for the library to promote its resources. Um, and you know, uh, whenever you talk about, when you start thinking about the university in total, um, I know it just drives uh, uh, university administrators crazy whenever they find out that uh, students are paying for their articles in a packet whenever the library already has full text, unlimited full text access to the same articles uh, online. So uh, this allows the whole university to present a, f a front to the students and faculty uh, as a cohesive whole, and the library becomes part of that. Um, I will jump in here and say that one of our sites that have implemented this are actually a consortium that has an effort to do OER resources in learning management systems to reduce the cost of students um, uh, as they take their courses, try to eliminate the high-priced textbooks that get added on top of all of the things that the students have to pay for. Um, they were already well on their way to having a program that they called a uh, one-click uh, one -click class reads, I think was the name of their program, where they would curate lists of open educational resources that faculty members could easily tap into in their learning management system. And when they saw this tool, this actually fit very well in line with that, helping faculty members make use of materials that are not going to cost students extra dollars on top of what they're already doing. Um, Right, so when we implemented it, um, I had to talk to the people uh, at a, in the IT department. And, uh, you know, the technical hurdles, I mean, we put it into a test environment. Um, you know, we found out it worked. Uh, the, the people, the Moodle admins, I'll say, um, were, you know, saw what it did. Um, and then we, uh, that was in fall of 2013, summer and fall of 2013. Uh, December of 2013, uh, we put it live on the Moodle site, and now we're in that kind of soft launch period um, where we got some instructors. There are a few instructors that are using it right now, and then we're going to come out with the guns of the Navarone as far as the publicity uh, in the summer and uh, and fall semesters, and uh, really push to to uh, promote it, put it on our website, um, and go out there and and really try to get some use out of it. Um, but uh, one sort of side benefit or a meta effect that I found was that it allowed the library to uh, interact with the IT department uh, at LSU. Um, our uh, funny story is that um, whenever Eric was actually doing a, a presentation online, uh, I put out an email blast to all the library staff to say, hey, this is something that we're thinking about implementing. Uh, come next semester, you know, you want to, you probably want to watch it. Um, what I didn't realize is that, that in that same email blast, it was going out to the IT staff uh, who are off, who are off, uh, not in the library. But anyway, so I got an email back and they said, uh, are you thinking about putting a piece of software in the Moodle? Because uh, you realize that it has to go through a committee and it has to be approved. And uh, I was like, oh, no, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to do all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it's not, it, it, you know, we still have to do all that stuff. It's, technically, it works. But um, I had to explain to some people who hadn't uh, quite realized what it was yet. And, but once they saw it, it was, uh, 
it was a great project to work with them with because uh, the the benefits were immediately obvious. You know, it's uh, it's a tool that doesn't try to do a whole bunch of stuff. It's basically taking uh, you know our discovery service and you know putting it putting it where the people are. Um, it's a you know the scope is limited, but it does what it does effectively. Uh, so it's a limited scope, um, but does it well. And then um, you know once they saw it, it went to uh, it went to the committee. I didn't even know the committee was meeting. Nobody like called me and said, "Hey, you need to be here." And you know they just kind of uh, approved it, and it went through. And they said, "Oh, by the way, this thing is approved. You can go ahead and do it." Okay, great. You know, I was already planning on it. When's the meeting? Oh, it was uh, last week. So uh, it went through, and then um, and then you know now now we're using it. So uh, it you know now I'm having like lunch with these people <laughs> that I didn't know before, who were like you know wondering why are you trying to put software in a in our Moodle sort of thing just a couple months before. I think one of the you know one of the things that this illustrates is how easy it is to get support for this type of application both within the library and within IT departments because it makes everybody's product better. So it makes the library's uh, discovery system better in the sense that it makes these materials more available, but it also made, at least at LSU and, and the few other sites that we already have up and running with us, it makes the LMS better. Uh, the faculty members perceive this as new functionality in my Moodle course that, that makes my teaching easier to do. Um, and for that, uh, I think, you know, Mike's anecdote about the IT committee that oversees what gets put into Moodle and what doesn't get put, put into Moodle, it being approved without even Mike's knowledge that it got approved is, it kind of speaks to, to what kind of impact that this tool has. Um, at our pilot site, where, you know, we picked a, uh, an EDS site that we knew was very close with EDS, uh, they were very friendly to us, and we asked them to find some library champions within their uh, their college, and they identified about 10 faculty members who they knew if this thing crashed and burned and bled mid-semester that they wouldn't hate the library for it. Uh, we found a pilot site that would do that with us as we experimented with this tool. And what ended up happening at the end of the semester, luckily nothing crashed and burned, it all worked as designed, but those 10 faculty members actually got together and wrote a letter to the provost, um, uh, to, um, you know, to the provost saying what a great value add this was to their online teaching and learning experience. And in turn, the provost returned a letter to the director of the library saying, you know, you know, keep up the good work. This is the kind of thing that we want, we want to see happen as we make further inroads into the online learning uh, space. Um, so this kind of tool has the ability to make the library very visible in that teaching and learning experience. Um, not only this tool, but that LTI protocol in general. If that's where things are happening, when it comes to teaching and learning on your campuses. There are blended classes, there are online classes, there are MOOCs, there are things happening in the digital realm on, at your university. The LTI protocol in all of those kinds of systems that provide those kind of learning experiences might provide a lot of new opportunities for library services. Um, the reading list tool is one example of them. Um, so I'm going to jump over to this other slide here. Um, I just want to give you another example of how the LTI protocol is being used. Um, before I joined EBSCO, about a year and a half ago now, I was head of library systems at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. Um, that's where I learned about the LTI protocol and started getting interested in it, but I didn't get a chance to build it until I came to work for EBSCO. Uh, but um, you know, the, you know I, I hired an assistant while I was working there, and now he's kind of in my role there at St. Ed's. And we've been going back and forth about what else can we do with this LTI protocol. And he's built a very, very lightweight redirecting application that essentially it takes that same batch of data, that LTI launch data, who they are, what course they're coming from, and then it redirects to their course guides and libguides based on what course they're coming from. So uh, in this particular instance, if there is a specific course guide for that class number, it can redirect to that libguide because uh, you know, the script says, okay, they're coming from political science, 1306, uh, that belongs at this libguide, so that's what we'll redirect students to. If there's not one, it fills over to, well, what discipline are they coming from? Oh, they're coming from music. I'll show them our music research guide here. And if that fails, there's no discipline research guide up there at all. Then it just fails over to the library's general, general search box. So it's these kind of nuanced connections into the learning management system that 
end up having a fairly powerful effect, a very contextually relevant link without any additional work uh, having to happen on a class-by-class -class basis. So the reading list link, you know, Mike did some setup to install this tool at LSU, but once the setup was done, it was done for all the classes. It's not like he has to go in and set up a new list here, a new list here, a new list here. It's just a new tool. The same with this. Once this is set up the once, all faculty members need to do is add this, you know, add library research guides as their external tool, and that link goes immediately to the correct libguide. So the LTI protocol provides a lot of opportunities for creating these kind of embedded experiences. Um, perfect. Um, you know, I've got a couple of other ideas. So I'm the developer of the, the reading list tool. Um, I got a chance to make it while I worked for EBSCO, and it came out of conversations uh, that we had as we, you know, as I traveled with the sales team to figure out well, what are the, the key things library users struggle with in interacting with library materials. I mean, EBSCO is a provider of a discovery system, uh, which is, you know, one step, but that only gets you as far as a library web page, right? You can embed a search box in a library web page to provide access to the bulk of your library's collection using a discovery system. But not everybody goes to the library web page. So one of the things that we grappled with at one of these meetings was, well, let's consider the case of the faculty member. How might they want to use library materials? Where might they want to use library materials? Where would it make the most sense to have library materials? And more often than not, it wasn't just on the library web page. It was in a course management system. Um, you know, there are a variety of other places that people might need library resources. And that's the kind of approach that we're starting to take uh, with EDS is well, where else can we plug EDS around the teaching and learning experience? So some ideas is, well, one is like annotated bibliography assignment. It's not uncommon for uh, the first stage of a research project to involve an annotated bibliography assignment where they go out, they do research, they compile, you know, three to ten resources, they annotate it, they format it properly in MLA or APA citation style, and they turn it in, and that's their assignment. This tool, if you imagine it being flipped on its head, where the students are the ones that are presented with the search box, and they're the ones adding things from the library's collection to their reading list, and then annotating them, and then the faculty member ends up just seeing their students' reading list and can grade them right there within the system, that's one of the next steps we're gonna do uh, with the reading list tool, is to flip it into a gradable assignment called the annotated reading list tool. Um, there has been notion of course reserves. Um, what were your uh, librarians saying when you, uh, about adding like print materials to the... Right, uh, whenever I started uh, promoting, the, pr promoting this tool, uh, we did a couple courses, not only in the library, uh, but also for faculty to start using it. Um, one thing that surprised me was that uh, they wanted to use the reading list tool uh, for things that weren't full text access, because that's the thing I was thinking about, was like, you want that one click you know, the student goes right to it. They just, uh, they wanted a list of, uh, of materials that people would have to come to the library to use. Um, and apparently uh, there's not a tool already that, that does that, or if there is, they, uh, they thought this was a little bit easier. Um, I mean, we have course reserves sort of functionality in our uh, ILS, um, which I have to deal with a lot, but um, they thought this might be uh, an improvement over the course reserves sort of, uh, functionality that's in the ILS so that the student could just um, have a list of things that they need to read for this week or for the semester, print it out and then walk to the library and then go right to the desk and then have the, um, you know, get the stuff that's on reserve right there. Um, so, you know, whenever we were started promoting this tool, that's, uh, that was another way that um, we started reaching out to different parts of the um, of the university because um, you know I, I, it was it was something that was unexpected. Another unexpected thing was that um, people, uh, administrators and teachers from um, LSU Online or the Continuing Education uh, departments came over. Uh, they have different instances of Moodle, but I hadn't really thought about them. Whenever I was you know I was thinking about you know our the you know the traditional student bodies at this point. But uh, they're really interested in this part of it, and we'll, you know, we'll start having a discussion about uh, getting this online for them um, so that they're able, because they're really interested in that full text access, being able to go online 24-7 you know, and reaching this material. So there are three main takeaways that, that 
I've seen happen on campuses that have installed this tool. Um, one is uh, the building of relationships. So, you know, Mike mentioned uh, having, you know, it's it, it, very anecdotal. I have lunch with the IT guys now where I never had that kind of connection before. It's those informal uh, relationships that I think spur the innovation between two different departments. So a project like this could be the thing that sparks these kind of collaborations across the different departments. Um, the statistics that you may be able to pull out of this reading list tool are quite interesting. So one thing you could easily do right now is pull, well, what are the readings that have been added to reading list? To get a list of titles and journals that are being used in your courses. But you could also, and again, we're not collecting this now, but if you wanted to get creative and push the boundaries of privacy, I guess one thing you could do is start profiling, you know, all right, students who access X number of readings on average over the course of the semester get a better GPA or tend to graduate. There's a potential here for gathering that kind of data. Um, we obviously have strayed away from it at this point because I don't think we've uh, got the same perspective. You know, I've been out of, out of the frontline librarianship for about uh, a year and a half now. So I feel like I'm a little bit too distanced from, from that to make effective decisions on what kind of data we can collect. But that might be an opportunity for libraries to explore um, what kind of statistics they could potentially gather out of a tool like this. Uh, and then the last one is fairly apparent, getting that visible library presence in the online classroom space.